Have you ever had a misunderstanding of something, like like something it would take to do whatever it is? Um, or maybe there's another saying that's like, a uh, uh, bit off more than you can chew. Well, when I was 19 years old, I had just finished a one-year Bible program, and I was like, okay, I want to go to Bible college to continue pursuing a career in ministry, and I wanted a certain education to get it. And so a buddy of mine and I, Adam, we were in Des Moines, and we had decided that we're going to travel to Eugene, Oregon to, final, or to finish school uh, at a college over there. Now, here's the thing. It is a 30-hour drive from Des Moines, Iowa, all the way to Eugene, Oregon. And so Adam and I, for whatever reason, we decided to leave at 9 o'clock at night uh, in Des Moines. And so Adam and I, we headed out, and he had the first leg of the trip, and he got us to Omaha, Nebraska, which is a good two-something hours from Des Moines. And we swapped roles because I told Adam, I enjoy driving at night because like nobody's on the road, you can just go and go and go. And so we swap roles. And so I'm driving in Nebraska. Now, if you've ever been to Nebraska, it is quite possibly the most boring state to ever go through. And I'm driving at night and I'm just trucking it. And I get all the way to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and Adam and I, we switch roles again. And so now Adam is driving. He drove through the state of Wyoming, part of Utah, into Idaho, and he pulls over in Idaho. And we swap roles again. And I told Adam that I can drive the rest of the way. Now, at leaving at 9 o'clock at night, essentially what happens is that I drive through two nights, which is crazy to do. And so I'm driving in Oregon. Now, once you hit Oregon, on the eastern part of Oregon, it's still a good eight hours drive to Eugene. And so I'm driving and I'm driving. And the longer I'm driving, the more and more tired I get. I then realize that as I'm driving, I'm in the middle of a parade. And I start waving at people and they're waving at me and saying hi, you know, all this kind of stuff. I'm in the middle of a parade. It was, it was, it was pretty great. Uh, except when I realized that I'm driving in the nighttime and there is no parade. And I wake up because I had drifted off to sleep. I look down and I'm driving 10 miles an hour in between Bend and Eugene on Highway 126. And I look up in the rear view mirror and I see 10 cars deep honking at me because I'm driving so slow. I pull over on the side of the road and I wake up my buddy Adam. I said, Adam, you have to wake up, you have to drive. He's like, what's going on? I said, I almost killed this man. I fell asleep and so he yells at me and we swap roles and he drove the rest of the way there. Thank God nothing happened. Uh, but I definitely thought to myself that I really understood what I was getting myself into, but I really had no idea. Now, to relate that story in what we're talking about today, there's a lot of this, the, the Jewish nation, excuse me, the Jewish nation, they had a misunderstanding of what Jesus' point was being here on earth. They thought he was this coming, conquering king, but in reality, he was come to bring peace and, and to bring hope to a hopeless world and to have a, a chance for us to have a relationship with the Father through him. But they had this idea that he was a conquering king that was going to take over a nation and become the greatest nation ever. And so there's this like kind of mix up here and this misunderstanding of what his purpose, what his point was, and what really he was about. So today, though, we're going to look at a follower of Jesus that actually had a clearer understanding of, of what it's about or what he was about. And so we're going to be talking about Mary of Bethany. Now, before we get into her story, I kind of want to set the scene of Palm Sunday because today is Palm Sunday. And so in Matthew 21, this is what happens. This is the scene that happens in Matthew 21. It says, A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. In verses 10 11 says, When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. 
Now, again, we see that people are cheering. They're excited about this conquering king. But the reality is Jesus is a king, but he had a different purpose, a different reason why he came to earth. And uh, they, they have this idea that Jesus is arriving on a war horse. But in reality, he showed up on a donkey. He's a, this symbol of peace, this symbol of the Lamb of God, this symbol of who he is, isn't exactly what the Jewish nation believed he was doing or the point that he was here for. And they missed the whole point of Jesus, but Mary didn't. Now we're going to look at Mary, and Mary you will constantly see at the feet of Jesus. Again and again and again, she's at his feet. And it's a place of surrender. It's a place of acknowledging who he is and who she is not. It's a place of knowing that she's going to hopefully put more and more trust in him and, and believing in who he is. So we're gonna, the first story we're going to look at with uh, Mary of Bethany is in chapter 10 of Luke. It says, Now as they were on their way, Jesus and a group of his followers, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha, which is Mary's sister, welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister who's called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. In verses 41 and 42, it says, But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, and it will not be taken away from her. Now, the first thing I want to lean into is this journey of relationship. This journey of relationship. Now, for us, when we think to earn grace. We need to do, we need to do, we need to do. It's almost like we're earning our place and, 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 or earning our favor. Sometimes we think for us to be blessed with certain things, we need to pray a certain way, or we need to have somebody else pray for us. Um, Or we even think as crazy as it is, there's these uh, posts that say, if you post this in three days, you're going to be blessed. And there's people that truly believe those things. But where do we see Mary? We see her who sits at the Lord's feet and listens to his teaching. Now the word listen here is actually this to gain understanding. That's what she's doing. She's trying to gain understanding of her Lord. And and for me, when I picture what's going on, is that she's sitting at the edge of her seat. And she's, she's uh, like biting into everything he's saying. The stories, the miracles, the healings, the parables, like everything that they've done. And she's just, she's just so excited to be at his feet. Now, culturally speaking, this is unheard of. It was really not a welcome sight for a woman to know how to read or uh, learn scripture or anything like that because women were designed to be helpmates. And so what that means, they need to be serving men. They need to be serving, going, doing things. But where do we see Mary? At Jesus' feet. Because Mary was more concerned about Jesus than her culture. Are you that way? Are you more concerned about Jesus than your culture? Or is it more about what's going on in the world than who Jesus is? Now, I'm not saying put your head in the sand and act as if nothing is happening. But if we know more about culture, we know more about what's going on in the world instead of who Jesus is, we're missing the bigger picture. But Mary is there. Mary wanted to know Jesus no matter what. And too many of us are like Martha. And and for some of us, we become so much like Martha, we even get kind of maybe frustrated or, or even angry at Jesus. Catch her here. She says, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to come help me. And, and Martha was all about the doing Mary was all about the being. 
She was all about just being in relationship with the Lord. Martha was all about doing things for the Lord. God never said to work for blessings, to do all this stuff so you can get more and more and more. Because when we do that, we can become anxious because it feels like we never measure up or we never do enough. And what happens is instead of focusing on Jesus, our eyes are on all the other things. But we are invited into a journey of relationship, a journey of authenticity, to be real, to be honest, to be open, to talk about things that matter with the Lord. Not just always doing, 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 get this done, this done, this done. Not, okay, I got to go to the church because the church is open. I got, I got this, I got to lead this life group. And then after this, I need to go do all, these are all good things. But again, if our eyes are only on those things, we lose focus on the real thing. And that's Jesus. Don't be about the doing, be about the being. Be in relationship with the Lord. So a question I have for you today is this. Are you living with Jesus or for Jesus? Are you living with him or are you just too busy doing things for him? Now, when things are good, we see Mary uh, at Jesus' feet. Like Jesus shows up and they're having this good time. All of this stuff is happening. And, and we see Mary at his feet. But what happens though when tragedy hits? Do we see Mary doing something else or having a different heart? When John chapter 11, there's this scene that happens where Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus is sick. And I'm not talking about the, the sick that's like a cold kind of sick, but like sick like on the deathbed type of sick. And so they send some messengers to search and find Jesus. And so they send them out and the messengers find Jesus and they're like, hey Jesus, you got to come back to Bethany because Lazarus, the, the person that you love, the person you care about is sick. So what, it, what is Jesus' response? In John chapter 11, verses 5 and 6, it says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he had heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days there longer in the place where he was. If you have your Bibles with you, I want you to highlight so. If it's me, and I know a friend is sick, on their deathbed type of sick, I'm going to do whatever I can to be there with them in that moment. I'm going to jump on an airplane. I'm going to drive there. I'm going to do what I can to be there with them, let alone a loved one. I would do whatever it takes. But what do we see Jesus doing? It says he, he loved them, so he decided to wait two more days. I mean, for me, that doesn't make sense. Like, why wouldn't you just leave right away? But Jesus was connected to God in a much deeper way because he wanted to bring glory to God in the midst of trials. And so what happens is that uh, uh, Jesus, uh, real quick, uh, the, the next point is a journey of trust. A journey of trust. And so Jesus shows up a few days later in Bethany. And first Martha like runs out and sees him. And she says this, like, if you would have been here, my brother would have lived. And then she goes on and, and to talk about that he is the son of God, like he is all that. And, and so he then calls for Mary. And so Martha go get, goes and gets Mary and Mary comes out and she essentially says the same thing. If you would have been here, my brother would have lived. And I love this about Jesus. Jesus meets her in her grief. He, he lets her uh, uh, have doubts. I mean, it, it's almost like she, she has this trust. If you would have been here, I know that he would have lived, but you didn't show up. It's this trust that's mingled in doubt. He lets her have doubts. And I love that about Jesus. He lets us wrestle and struggle in, in moments and in times where it's difficult. 
And he does this with Mary. A journey with Jesus means bringing all that we are. Is being everything with him. Instead of holding things back, we're, we're opening up, we're sharing about our lives and we're beginning and hopefully beginning to trust in who he is. And he lets us wrestle with our struggles and wrestle with our doubts and wrestle with our questions. For you, trust is challenged when things are tough. For me, uh, uh, trust is hard when things don't line up exactly the way that I wish that they would. But in those moments, what is your response? Are, are you so angry that you can't communicate to Jesus? Are you so angry that you can't fall to his feet and have trust even in the midst of a little bit of doubt? Are you willing to bring God in those times and to walk with Jesus there? I believe this, that when we do, we will experience God's goodness so much over our lives and our faith will grow exponentially more than it ever had before. But it's hard. It can be frustrating. And, and remember, it, it, he, 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 he could have left, but he decided to stay. And, and some people may feel like that's not loving. And, and love is to do whatever you can at that exact moment. But it's not because he isn't loving. It's because he is love. He wants to use and to work with us in these tough moments. In the hardest seasons of life, we can see the greatest leaps in our faith. Fifteen years ago, um, my daughter Abigail was was born, and um, <clears throat> she was born with a couple holes in her heart, and her veins around her heart was backwards. And when she was born, it was she was also premature. There was a whole lot of things going on with Ab. And, and uh, about a month later, we realized that her breathing tube was substantially smaller than what it should be. And so anytime she was sick, uh, her, her, her throat would swell up, her breathing tube would swell up, just like anybody's would when they're sick, and she couldn't get air in, in her lungs. And about three or four months later, we spent a lot of weekends and a lot of weeks in the hospital, and about three or four months later, we were finally able to do surgery on my daughter. And so what they did is that they took some cartilage from her ribs and they placed it over her breathing tube and made kind of like a graph for it to kind of open up her breathing tube where she would be able to breathe normally. Well, at this time, she was about seven months, eight months, nine months old. And so they put her in a self-induced coma after the surgery, just because she was so little, they didn't want her ripping out certain things and, and all that. And so they thought that would be the best route to take. And about almost a week of in this coma where my baby girl is just laying there in the bed, they start weaning her off of the drug to try to wake her up a little bit more and more. And I remember being in this hospital room and as they're weaning her off, I heard the scariest sound that I think a human, and especially in that moment, a parent could ever hear. I heard the sound of a machine flatline where my daughter's heart stopped beating. And in that very moment, uh, people are rushing in and they're pushing me out of the way and I want to get out of the way because I want them to help my daughter. And I'm standing outside this room and, and she's in the NICU wing and there's this little window on the side and I kind of look over and I see my little girl laying there as they're working on her. And in that moment, I remember saying, Jesus, I trust in you. Be with my baby girl right now. Now, my story is amazing where God healed her. And she's 15 years old now, and she's looking forward to driving, and she has all this life ahead of her. But in that moment, I had to choose to trust that's mingled with doubt. 
and my faith has grown exponentially more, not because my daughter lived, but because Jesus was present with me in the toughest moment of my life. Because Jesus was with me there, I know that he's going to be with me here. And when I have another thing that's tough that's coming up down the road, he was with me then, he's with me here, and he'll be with me there. He's with me all the time. And my faith in Jesus has grown exponentially more because he's present in my life. He let me, he, he, he let me have moments of doubt in the midst of faith. So in this story with Mary, it says, Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. In this moment, Jesus is present. In this moment, Jesus is close. In this moment, he, he is overwhelmed he is deeply moved and he's close to the brokenhearted here in a few moments he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead but in this exact moment he's deeply moved he's present he's there Lazarus uh, resurrects and now Mary has a deeper level of surrender because Jesus was there in the midst of her grief. So the question for you is, what do you struggle to trust Jesus with? What do you struggle to trust Jesus with? Now again, if you look at Mary, Mary was there um, at, at, at Jesus' feet to gain understanding, to know him more. Uh, uh, Mary fell at Jesus' feet to trust in a very difficult time. And then in the next chapter, in John chapter 12, we see another uh, example of how Mary knew and connected with Jesus much more and had a better understanding than what everyone else did on that Palm Sunday. And John chapter 12 says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served which isn't really a surprise, but Martha served and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, he was one that was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? So the last example we see is a journey of sacrifice, is a journey of sacrifice. Perfume, and, ex and especially this perfume, was extremely expensive. It was quite possibly the most expensive thing that Mary owned, like quite possibly the most expensive thing that she owned, and she uses it to anoint Jesus. She uses it to bless him, and it's this massive sacrifice that takes a place. And again, we see Mary kind of uh, doing things that's not really custom. Um, in that time, uh, women, were, it, it was seen as like audacious for a woman to let down her hair in public. And we see this, she, she lets down her hair by wiping his feet with her hair. It, 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 again, she's much more on connecting with Jesus than what the cultural norm is. But Mary's heart went to Jesus in sacrificial worship. Because a journey with Jesus includes sacrifice. It, it, it is a life of worship. It's not just a Sunday morning thing. It's not just a, you know, drop my kids off at kids night kind of thing and then go do my thing. It, it is an everyday thing. It's a Monday thing. It's a Tuesday thing. It's where Jesus is the center of your life. 
where everything evolves around him. And Mary gave up a year's worth of salary. That's how much 300 denarii is. And you have uh, uh, Judas here who points it out. He says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii? I mean, he has such low EQ. I mean, like an awkward moment. I mean, everybody's sitting back and they're like, what is going on? And Judas brings up the cost. And you would think by this statement that he's like, you know, he loves, you know, to help people, but he was actually skimming off from the top. Judas, uh, uh, Judas thought that was too much love for Jesus. That was his thought. That's, that's too much love. That's too much sacrifice for Jesus. But Mary wasn't concerned because she gave everything. Now as Followers of Jesus were supposed to be imitators of him. In less than a week from now, from in this story, Jesus dies on the cross. Talk about the ultimate sacrifice. He dies on the cross for me and for you. And Mary imitates him by anointing his feet, by giving sacrificially to him. Now, now, sacrificially, why is, is because like this could be, let's say t- uh, hard times comes and, and she only has, uh, this is like her livelihood, essentially. If hard times come, this is what she can trade and barter so she can have some essentials for her life. But she's giving everything she has to Jesus. Now, Jesus uh, uh, she, Jesus says that she's preparing me for my burial. She's getting things ready. Now, I don't know if Mary, and it's not stated that Mary knew that thing, but all she knew is that she loved Jesus and she wanted to express it in a sacrificial way. Mary is saying, by this act, the bottle of fragrance pales in comparison to my devotion to Jesus. It pales in comparison to my devotion to Jesus. I love him more than anything else. Last week in our First Peter series, Pastor Jason hit me with a ton of bricks on something. He, he had said that the cross is the source of our salvation and our example. The cross is the source of our salvation. This is where we go not just only to find Christ, but in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This is the way that we get to the Father is with and through Jesus. So the cross is the source of our salvation, and it's our example. Jesus gave up he, the ultimate sacrifice, and as imitators, we are to give a sacrifice. So the question for you, does your journey with Jesus cost you anything? Does it cost you anything? Because if it doesn't, are you truly a follower of Jesus? Or are you part of the so excited that it's Palm Sunday, a conquering king is going to, we're going to have a new nation. We're going to have all of this stuff. Things are going to be amazing, but I'm unwilling to sacrifice. Does your, does your relationship with Jesus, does this journey with Jesus cost you anything? When you're on a journey with Jesus, it means uh, pairing with him. It's being connecting with him. It, it, it means to know him, to trust him, and to surrender everything to him. So I'm going to hand off to the campus pastors. You guys have a great Palm Sunday. And we'll see you soon. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around. I want to go over the transformational moment here. Um, how have you misunderstood the journey with Jesus? How have you misunderstood the journey with Jesus? Is, is there like a misunderstanding where it's a work, 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 do, do, do? 
Is there a misunderstanding where I have to keep like showing up even when it's hard to show up? Is, is there like this, like I, I need to give, 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 give. And, and the reality is in a relationship, there's give and take. And it's a joint kind of thing. We're doing it together. But there's a lot of misunderstandings that happen uh, for us in our journey with Jesus. So instead of having a jaded view on the purpose of Jesus, let's begin to trust, even in the midst of doubt, even in some troubled times, that he has our ultimate purpose at hand. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for you. Thank you for everything that you have done in our life. Thank you that you, you aren't just the God who came and, and died on a cross, but you're a God who's intimately involved in our life. That you want us to go on a journey with you. To not just always be about the doing and the working, but to be about a, a, a relationship with you where we do things together. And we have a relationship that's deep, a re relationship that's real, a relationship that's authentic. So thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Guys, have a great week and we'll see you soon.